Well, look at this. There is a Columbus tube, which means it's steel frame. Oh my goodness. This is actually made by Specialized. Specialized Epic. Who ever thought they made steel road bike frames? We'll talk about this and go over some really nice details about this bike after this. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hi, I'm Justin the guy. Obviously, I have a garage shop. Taking scary out of used bikes one bike at a time. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Welcome back to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hey, I'm Justin the guy on this old bike series. Check this out. Yes, Specialized LA. Well, Specialized LA is like their lower end ish but not necessarily low low they still had some gems within that particular model line which is kind of crazy to think and when you think model is just one bike or two well the lays of today and yesteryears uh, they have like the lay the pro the comp the sport the team whatever you know it's just they had several different mixes in there and over the years they kind of added to that which kind of really confuses the consumer obviously and that's just way too many skews but we're not talking about that today we're going to talk about what would it cost you if you were taking this in to have serviced yeah why did i bring this up i'm talking about new bikes being worked on all the time well this is i do repairs too and this is a bike i'm doing service on and it's one of my really good customers he has several several bikes this is the one out of several that I'm going to be working on this week. And to, you know, um, keep my YouTube channel going for you guys, I'm going to make some videos on his bikes, which he seemed to be just fine for making videos and featuring his bike. So in this case, same kind of scenario, I approach my, uh, my, my service almost as much as I refurbish my bikes personally. Reason being is... It's the same kind of concept behind all of this, right? Um, you know, when you take your bike in and get it tuned up or you're buying a bike that's from uh, the Red Barn from Trek or the Pro's Closet with their 151 point checklist thing that they provide, which are they really counting every spoke as a check? Uh, possibly. They would, <laughs> I don't know where they get the 151. Um, I'd like to see that number itemized um, on a spreadsheet, but hey, <laughs> you know, for me, I try to, you know, I wouldn't say dumb it down, but simplify it to more of a list of things that you do, like chewing the wheels and adjusting the hubs and adjusting the derailers and brakes, cleaning the drivetrain by taking the chain cassette and cranks and derailers off and put them in a sauna cleaner, making sure they're good and dry. Check for any worn parts and replace those. Cables and housing to be inspected, as well as the frame, as 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 to the shifters. So pretty much all contact points, pretty much the whole bike gets touched in a full tune-up. Well, supposedly in a full tune-up. That depends on your local bike shop and what they're saying. But I perceive it as a full tune-up. That's what that is. And the next layer above that is a drivetrain clean. The next layer above that is frame detailing. Another layer, that, I mean, it just all depends what your shop has to provide. They usually have one or two or three services. Um, back in the day, the simplest one was like a safety check run through. Basically, we adjusted your derailleurs, um, you checked your brakes, checked your wheels to be true on the bike, air up your tires, and lube the chain. That usually costs like 25 bucks, like a safety check. Um, part of the interruption, there is more. More, you say? Push the more button. Push it. Push it. I dare you to push it. Once you push that button, you get more details about the video you are watching, in addition to all the tools that I use in the shop, as well as suggestion for improving your ride. In addition to, to help me provide advocacy in the cycling community, also links to other social media accounts, as well as my website, to find the products that I actually sell and other insights in the industry. Other videos linked below, extend your cycling experience here on YouTube. And now back to your original programming. I would hate to say it, but some shops charge that as a tune-up, which I, I don't know. Anyway, um, I went to the store the other day. I'm not going to say any names, but um, they had a uh, an $89 tune-up, and I was like, oh, okay. And it had like two sentences, very, very vague. And I'm like, what are you including with that tune-up? 
And it's like, oh, we just adjust and torque the bolts and um, lube the chain and air the tires. And they're like, that takes you, what, five minutes, right? I mean, come on. I mean, it's like you consider that at 80 dollars know, Whoa, inflation. My goodness. Um, <laughs> anywho, if you're lucky to be near me or somewhere close to a person that does this kind of work and actually doesn't have a huge overhead um, and has a good mechanics or the a singular mechanic, that's probably the direction to go, especially if you have a higher end stuff. I have a customer base that I'm the only one they'll let touch their bikes and it's I've had that experience over the years working in shops even being the service manager like hey I want you to work on this nobody else I'm like hey okay I got it yeah I'll do it you know it's like that, that kind of thing is kind of flattering uh, but as an independent it's you know makes it a little more viable as in longevity of doing this and plus my volume is way low compared to what I used to have to do put it this way as a production mechanic I was doing somewhere between five to six tune-ups part-time within a five to six hour window a day. And when I do that three or four times a week, in conjunction with another job that I had, ah, that's, that's, that's a lot of not, not really focusing. I mean, you're focused on laser focused on one thing, but that's burnout. But anyway, enough said, what to expect from a tune-up. Or you'll see a, a gentleman or a lady like me or a service rider, basically. And those are the, like the, the, usually the better mechanics, in a sense, uh, because they've, they've touched and feel and experienced. And uh, they can you know, look and point out certain uh, issues right off the bat kind of deal. So in this particular case, the service manager would notice a, a cracked housing, so the housing needs to be replaced on the back. Um, all, all of them will have chain checkers of some sort and go, oh, yeah, that chain is way beyond um, the actual, uh, requ uh, what they suggest. And that walks also maybe compromise the cassette. So your cassette may be in question. So on this particular case, yeah, I'm going to tell the gentleman, he needs a new chain, a little bit of housing here. I might be able to save the cable. I'll inspect the rest of the cables too. The bar tape's good. So that's all right. The brake pads are good because I know I just replaced them about a year ago. So they don't look like they have too much wear and tear. Um, good service riders will actually take the wheels off right in front of you um, to, to inspect. And what, what are they inspecting? Well, they're inspecting the hub. <laughs> the first thing, like, woo, you got some white tires on here. Yeah, boy. Ugh, come on, 28s. Uh, okay, tired of finding it. I'm going to have to pop the cable on this. <sighs> so if, when you put a wider tire on there, this could be a booger. Um, it does fit the frame, which is good, but very close. I'll have to double check that when I install it back. I mean, when you're seeing a wider tire on this, you got to double check the brake caliper clearances and the frame clearances as well. Um, in this case, to change rear flat, you would definitely would have to have a cable um, or an Allen wrench to adjust that brake and have the know-how to adjust that brake back. Uh, being who sidebar any this way that you know if they take it off they can actually feel the hub and see if it's smooth um you know they usually can do a quick spin on the bike itself to see if the rim is true also inspect the tire the spot the tire in this case is good and the hub it feels smooth let's see if we have a problem with the front here as we did with the rear so these brakes they have an opening they open up and their safety catches what they used to call lawyer tabs um, back in the day, they didn't have safety catches and you can see same kind of issue. It doesn't want to drop through. So this particular individual, and I know this guy, he, he knows how to do this. So if he's out in the field, he probably has a little tool in his pack. That's an Allen and knows he has to open up the brakes and readjust the cable tension to accommodate that wider of a tire. So feeling the hub, this hub kind of feels a little knocky a little bit, maybe a little tight. So I will definitely take a look at that and maybe pop it open and maybe inspect those bearings and races. Um, and then on, so I know the chain is no bueno and I inspected his bikes that he dropped off already. So he opted to do the, the wax chain treatment. So I waxed these chains yesterday. So you can see they're still hard and waxy. I'll have to break them free. And uh, once I measure it and install it when everything's been clean, and that's the trick on wax chains. You want all these bits 
to be ultrasonic clean and clear from any contaminants and old grease cleaned off that gives the best chance for that wax to do its magic while you're riding um, it does take about three or four I'd say, so let me take that back just about five to ten miles of riding to get that chain to break off and shed off all that extra wax. I try to do the best I can in the, in the shop and on the test ride. And I get them pretty damn smooth. Let's put it that way when they go out the door. But once you go on that first ride, it's gonna kind of feel not as smooth, but man, once you hit that buttery moment, you're like, oh, this is it. <laughs> this is it. This is the buttery moment of smoothness. And what's nice is you bump your chain. You say, this guy, he got grease. Instantly, since these are waxed, They'll never, they don't put any kind of, they don't shed any grease. So for kids' bikes, great thing. <laughs> My daughter's, her chain, her wax, her chains are going to be waxed for sure. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be popping the derailleurs off, cleaning those. Um, the brakes, I'm going to you know, clean and probably uh, you know, sand down these pads. So as initial assessment of looking at this bike um, and knowing the shifters are pretty good. So, you know, your standard hundred-ish dollar tune-up with a couple upsells of a new chain, maybe cassette, and cable there being put on. And when you add that on a la carte, and sometimes they charge labor for that chain to be installed with a cable like this scenario, um, that would be probably 15, 20 bucks um, in labor for the cable or another you know, 15 or 20 on the chain to be installed. Um, but if you're doing a drivetrain clean, oh, that kind of nicks that, but you maybe have to pay 50 bucks more than parts for the drivetrain clean for that step up for that tune-up. So you kind of have to kind of weigh and do your balances. So in this case, you could do a standard tune for 100, another, you know, maybe 30, 35 bucks for, um, for the labor for the cables and the chain to be installed. And then you'd still have to pay for parts. So the chains are, you know, anywhere between 15 to 25 to 30, uh, even higher if you wanted to go crazy. This is a nine speed, so it's gonna be around that 25, 20, $25 range. And the cable housing pieces are, they're for, they usually charge for a foot, it was like a buck or two or something like that. And then you just have the labor on top of that. So all encompass on this particular bike, you're probably looking about 150 bucks top ish maybe 160 when you're looking at tax or depending what kind of chain you want to put on there so yeah um not too terrible in that sense and uh you know the tune up on this one since i i'm the one that actually refurbished this by consult it to him this thing I already had my magic and as me mechanics and bike shops especially local bike shops if you know if they've been working on your bike they know it's i'm not necessarily going to say it's easier they just already are more familiar with it and what they've already addressed is the same kind of cookie cutter um process that they do so it's not really too much of a mystery when i work on this stuff it's like okay what to look for what not to not really necessarily need to focus on too much this has already been looked into um yeah i might want to check that headset too it's kind of maybe a little not as smooth or maybe it just needs to be adjusted oh yeah and it may be adjusted because he had added a little um a, a surface light cap here which he changed the adjuster cap which he may have played with the stem so as a mechanic we're always trying to figure out what did you do to your bike <laughs> you're like what's the mystery you're like did you mess with this did you play with this trailer adjuster back there and when you're dropping your bike off be full up front and tell them everything you may have done to the bike. That just helps us go, oh, okay, because adjusting a rear derailleur is not easy sometimes, and sometimes some people just don't, don't understand it. It's just like this process, and it, you know, certain mechanics have certain skill level, and that's why they're bike mechanics, but they have, they're just you know, mechanically inclined. You hear that word. What does that mean? Well, that means that person is usually an introvert and likes taking things apart and putting them back together. <laughs> so that's why mechanics are not usually people persons uh peoples but as my wife tells me i'm kind of an anomaly but i mean i have a passion for bikes i like sharing that passion i will talk your ear off all day long about bikes it's just that's how i am and um, i used to be that introvert and a little side note on this and story at back in parker bikes i was a shy kid and um 
I'd be in the back and I'm learning how to put bikes together, you know, and, you know, doing those kinds of things and learn how to fix flats and then throw little repairs at me to, you know, just kind of cut my teeth on and start working on doing repairs. And about a year or so into it and the big season started kicking on, it's like, so Justin, get on the sales floor and go sell a bike. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like this, <laughs> oh crap moment. And, you know, I start talking to me. It's like, hi, can I help you? You know, and then people would be asking about stuff. I'm like, I don't know the answer to that. And they go run in the back. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but after a while, I warmed up to that process. My dad was a super people person. He loved tinkering too. So he was that other kind of anomaly as well as what I've become today. And um, yeah, he'd talk people's ears off. And people would come in. And tell, all they do is talk. And it's like, you going to buy anything? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But um, he really helped me in the process of being personable, a so, I wouldn't say soft selling, just being personal and just, you know, explaining this stuff, you know, the trying to try to take in their perspective of walking in the shop and that kind of thing, where a lot of, you know, they have classes on this um, for businesses and training courses within Big Five Sporting Goods where I worked at, had the same kind of concept. It was really kind of funny. I'm sitting there and reading their playbook and I'm going, yeah, I, I, this is, yep, uh, yep, I, I know all this. Yeah, I've been done doing it for all these years. I picked up a couple of extra gold nuggets along the way. But anywho, um, that's where you're faced with when you're looking at the service department. And and there's um, <laughs> there was this video I saw a week or so ago, and it was like, why are mechanics a-holes? And they're like, I have to watch this because <laughs> this is so funny. And he had top, top, top 10 reasons and they really hit home and resonate but it is it comes down to mechanics are really just mechanical uh, inclined individuals and sometimes they're really not people per, you know, people people you know they're just they just kind of focus and you know it's kind of like software developers not to throw you under the bus but you all know the same thing and um and that's where that's what my job in software is, was or is is the the guy between <laughs> so anywho um back to the bike and figuring out with this and that's what you're faced with when you're looking into you know the people people are usually up front hopefully um they've been vetted to to be able to you know, correspond but their job is to look for things and also upsell things that's what a service rider is supposed to do is like oh that chain's on mini yorker you know me, I'm going to be like, ah, you may get another season out of these. Yeah, you may get another season out of tires. But if I see anything that's dangerous or like close to being worn, then that's when it's kind of like, ah, you got to pull that lever and uh, yeah, shoot, shoot it and get it, get, get it going, that kind of thing, to make sure it's safe and right. Because at the end of the day, what is our primary job? Well, make sure the bike is functioning as the highest performance, right? Sometimes that equates to upselling. But the other thing is the biggest factor is we want to make sure it's safe to ride. Let me repeat that again. We want to make it safe to ride. Why? Well, we don't want that person to get hurt because we want that person to keep riding and enjoying and come back healthy. Um, there's, enough, there's enough obstacles out there for riding and dangers from like cars or trails or rattlesnakes or whatever that the bike, we want to try to make the bike as safe as possible. So when it comes to the situation, it's like, hey, can I get you know, any more life out of that tire? And if they're honestly saying, mm, for safety, I would switch that tire out, just do it. A $50 tire is going to save you so much more. That's so much cheaper than an ER visit. And if anybody had a blown out in an unto two time, I don't even say that right, at a wrong time, <laughs> you're going down. I'm sorry, the ground's hard. And the older you get, like this guy, you don't bounce anymore. It's more like a hard thud and you hear a crack and you're like, and then you're like, can I get home? <laughs> or do I need to pull my phone out, which I'm actually looking at it, um, how to get home? Do, you know, so we want to make sure. And also there's also skill set there. And if you, if you feel like you need to uh, spruce up on those skills, uh, contact your local shop. They may have trainers out there that just do recreation, not for not for racing or anything, but just for people to get comfortable um, of getting into riding and those kinds of things. And I think there's classes out there uh, as well, like within meetup groups and so forth, and clubs. Um, cycling clubs may have features like that too. So look those up. So the end of the day, we want the safe to ride, um, functioning at 
you know, that's number one, top of the list, and then we want it to be functioning as the best performance possible. And again, we are human beings. We, you know, the, the biomechanic that's in a production setting, they're under a lot of stress and they're working really hard and really fast, and sometimes things get missed. It just happens. Um, when you're looking at mechanics kind of like me, you know, I'll chew on this for a day and a half. Not me, not the whole time, but I'll start it. Then I'll do another project or go, do, or go pick up my kid from school and come back. And I come back and I you know, work on it, tweak on it a little bit more, take it on smaller bites of it. Um, and that's just my luck of my scenario. And that's kind of how my business rolls in that perspective is you know, I have to sometimes shelf things to go something that takes priority uh, for the time. But anywho. And that happens in the store too. Well, back in the day, you know, uh, because we'd be working on mechan and working on bikes, and then we'd have people come in the door, and they're like, "Oh, we got to put the wrench down and go see what you need. Like, do you need a new tube? Oh, you're looking for tires? Oh, you're looking for a bike for your kids or whatever?" That's what we ended up doing. A lot of times, we were constantly interrupted um, in that aspect. So it is a two-sided thing, and that's kind of the environment of a shop. Um, with me, luckily. The only person that's really bothering me is my little dog, my daughter when she's home, and, you know, making a YouTube video. <laughs> Which, actually, this is so muscle memory, and what really the skill set of really doing the detail at the final end, that's where, you know, it really counts. And I'm the kind of guy, when I do see something at the end, I'm like, oh, crap. I will go back and redo it, then try to put a Band-Aid on it to just kind of push it through. That's the kind of person you want to look for in a mechanic working on anything, like from electricity to plumbing to your car to bikes. That's the kind of mentality. It's not, if it's not done right, it's not done right at all. Um, that's what my dad is ingrained in me back in the Parker Bikes days. Um, and it comes down to, number one, safety. You guys riding those bikes, right? So, yeah, I'm um, going to be tearing this crank set off and everything, throw an ultrasonic cleaner, cleaning up the parts and, uh, you know, making sure it's good. And, you know, make, you know, I have a checklist that I do. A lot of shops do, um, ask if you go into a shop, that's the thing to ask for is like, Hey, do you have a checklist at the end that shows that everything has been done to the bike? If they have that blank look on their face and then you go somewhere else. Uh, because that's one of those things that you want to have a consistency within your own store as a store manager you want to make sure or a store owner you want to make sure those things are consistently across the board from every mechanic and that's the, the thing that you want to ask for um, good gold nugget there and hey you know it's one of those situations where um, this is, you know, right now, you'll probably be seeing this video, it's in the fall, off-season. This just re, you know, re, re, really directs to the off-season. Off-season, you got two things going for you. The mechanics are a little calmed down, less stressed out. Their workflow is a little more manageable. And in addition to, the uh, bike shops slow down to the point where they start providing discounts and coupons. So that's where you have your A-team still left because they have to shorten the hours or let the people go in the off-season, depending how drastic the season is in your area. San Diego, no bueno. It's always year-round. Uh, believe it or not, Seattle, Washington is the same thing. It's like even though it's rainy, they are busy year-round. It's just year round, it's just whatever. Uh, but if you're not in one of those areas, it's going to have a seasonal thing, seasonal flow to it, and there's going to be coupons on the off season. And usually, your the A team is left there to work on the bikes. So you got three things going for you. You know, a little bit less expensive up front. Um, you got the better person working on your bike, and it's going to have a longer time looked at in the stand while they're working on it. Because they're going to be jibber jabbering in the back, more relaxed manner, looking at things, you know, working on it, and so forth. Versus like grind, 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 get through it as fast as we can. Um, because a lot of the shops that do commission based on a lot of their mechanics, so it, it behooves them to go through as many bikes as they can to get to that livable wage. Yeah, I, yeah, I just brought that up. So. Keep in mind, um, there's several aspects of this as the mechanics go, and a lot of people have the misnomer of like, well, you need to tip your mechanic beer. Um, a lot of shops are fine with that. Some shops are not because maybe they, you know, maybe they don't drink. Um, it's always better to tip in good old greenbacks. Um, hey, give that mechanic an extra 10 bucks, you know, something like that. That will go miles um, with the shop and your rapport with them because they'll remember you <laughs> for sure um, in that aspect. And in addition to you'll get that extra service like, ah, he's back. I'm going to go take a little extra time to work on his bike because you know, at the end of the day, he tipped me last time. I'm not expecting the next time, but 
you know, there is some gratuity there and aspect. It is a service industry. Treat it like you do when you go out to dinner or get a cup of coffee. Yeah, it's just, and, and when I re referenced that uh, top 10 list of why uh, mechanics are grumpy individuals, that was number 10 on the list to start off. But anyway, check out that video too. It was kind of entertaining and funny. Um, but, you know, don't take it insulting, please. It's just one of those situations that every job has its beauties and it all has its hardships as well. Um, I'm just very fortunate to take the great pieces of what I've experienced and be able to confold it into my little shop in my garage. Um, that doesn't mean I don't have my hardships. I do. But in a sense, though, they're less than far and few in between versus on a daily basis. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, I think I've done my time. So here we are. Um, but anywho, thanks for hanging out with me and hanging out in the garage. Check out the final results after I got this all wrapped up and beautified. The guy's magic. After this. So I thought I'd review the parts. So I took apart the jockey pulleys so we can get the clean on the inside. You know, Sonic Cleaner doesn't get all on that little dirty bits there, so those got cleaned up. Cassette is clean. It's going to get a new wax chain, as we talked about. It's hanging over there, all dried up and ready to go. And also these chain rings. Well, if you ever had any experience with these 6500 uh, chain rings, um, they stain. Um, they're functionally fine, but they stain. So I cooked it like five times in the ultrasonic cleaner with a whole bunch of carb cleaner and scrubbed it to get the stains out. So they actually look really good. And by doing that, I had to take it completely apart off of the crank set. And also these, they have spacers, which go on the back side of the big chain ring um, up against here onto the, on the back side there. So it's good to take these apart periodically. So they're, you know, adjusted and all that. Not necessarily adjusted, but cleaned up and get all the gunk out of there. So those are good. The wheels turned out amazing. Still really true. The front hub just need a little bit of adjustment, and that's really good. They cleaned up really well. And the highlight, bam, that frame. Oh, yeah, let's talk about the frame, which I did the intro, and I was like, oh, totally skipped over that part. So we're going to talk about this frame, but let's take a beautiful look of how this beautiful blue polished up. Hardly any scratches on this bad boy. It was immaculate when I first got it and sold it to this individual. And now it's in for its tune-up where it cleaned up quite beautifully. So let's recap. So yeah, let's talk about this steel frame from Specialized. Well, Specialized didn't do a lot of steel frames. I mean, I guess they did like in the late 80s, 90s, you know, and that was part of the course of road bikes back then. And then when aluminum and carbon got introduced in the late 90s, steel kind of just got shoved in the back corner. Steel is basically the cheap man's or poor man's titanium. Um, so the, the steel frames have a place and actually what proved that was Le Mans bikes. Uh, Le Mans were amazing and they were doing steels right up to the point they got cut off by Trek. And this is the same era of those early 90s, like 94, 93, I think this was. And they used Columbus tubing, which was used on various other bikes out there. Not as popular as the Reynolds, but the Columbus was still really light. And this is all tubing um, with the Columbus and it has a little painted on decal, that kind of thing. So these were kind of a one, two, three year runs um, within that early, early 2000s, which was awesome. And I always wanted one of these. And matter of fact, I do have a frame up here that so scarred up and has a ding in it. So I'm going to strip it at some point. It is my size, but it's one of those situations like it's not worth trying to fix up the paint so I'm going to strip it and make it a cool color or something but it is my size and also what's nice about these two they had a taller head tube so it's more of that laxed enduro um, kind of positioning where you're into the gravel bikes of today so that's what we're looking at with this you know beautiful Columbus tubing specialized almost in mint condition considering the age of it and the individual that owns this he rides this and has it all adjusted to the exact geometry spec of his newer Specialized Roubaix. And he actually hands down says, this rides better than the newer bikes. 
So don't pass over to some of those old Jim Le Mans specialized um, steel frames. Some of those bad boys ride even better to compare to today's bikes. Just saying, might be a little bit heavier, but it has that forgiveness feeling to it as a steel frame. So there you have it. Check out these beautiful pictures completely assembled after this. Uh, all right. 